my pleasure to introduce for the first time uh, at one of these B2 meetings. Um, I don't know if you've been to Dartmouth before. Um, Professor Annette Linou from Linau, sorry, from uh, UMass uh, Amherst, where she is assistant professor in the uh, Commonwealth Honors College. Uh, I have a very, very few things to say. I tell you I'm privy because I forgot your <laughs> uh, But she's come to be a figure of considerable interest in the Boundary Two Collective, largely because she does the kind of work that interests us foundationally. She is interested in the comparative functions of language. She is the master of many languages, contributions, her contributions to our ongoing interests would be profound. She works in Arabic, Wolof, and Malik, right? And she also is interested in the relationships between language practices and the materiality of language and their cultural and, and the cultural and political effects of such materialities. She is a person of considerable record in the acquisition of these languages. And she is now writing a book. I hope this description is still current or a book manuscript on language choice and ideology in the comparative literary histories of Egypt, Indonesia, and Senegal. And part of that work is already available for us in the journal Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, published by Duke. Such a journal, I did not know, so <laughs> see your CV, I did not know that such a journal of comparison existed. Take that to um, And that's talk today for us is called Poetics in the Spirit of Bandung. And regrettably, our good friend uh, Amar Mufti is not here to uh, hear this engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I just want to clarify that this is very much a work in progress. Um, some of these ideas are, are fairly raw. So I thank you in advance for your patience and also for your comments, criticisms, and questions, um, as this will help me reorient and improve some of these broad ideas. As I'm sure many of you need uh, no reminder, the first Asia-Africa conference held in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955 offers one of the earliest conceptions of the post-colonial as a common political and cultural project in the Asian-African context. The long under-examined in academic circles, the participants of Bandung were among the first to declare the primacy of cultural exchange between the continent's newly independent states. On the occasion of the now 60th anniversary of the Bandung Conference, new initiatives have emerged to revisit its literary afterlives within the first Afro-Asian Writers Association by scholars like Duncan Yoon, Hala Halim, and Rosan Jagalov. And the anniversary has occasioned broader explorations of its symbolic valence and significance for comparative studies across the global south. In contrast, perhaps in response to Dipesh Chakrabarti's claim of the disjuncture between post-colonial studies as a practice in the U.S. Academy and earlier anti-colonial nationalist movements, Amir Mufti had suggested in an earlier Boundary II lecture that Bandung should instead be considered an originary moment for post-colonial studies, leaving figures conventionally associated with the field's founding, like Edward Said, relative latecomers but integral contributors to a broader project of Bandung humanism. What is left then is to find a method or a scholarly practice through which to honor that shared legacy, to reorient the discipline of comparative post-colonial studies within a broader accommodation of the spirit of Bandung. In practical terms, however, this convergence beyond the national may be a daunting task given our current disciplinary configurations. To break with the common practice of limiting our comparative scope to languages of former European empires seems a primary imperative for comparative work in the Bandung spirit. There's, however, a double bind to the gravitational pull of the Europhone as both a burden and an anchor, 
to liberate or unmoor our comparative reach from the confines of a former colonial language also threatens to set us adrift towards the potential chaos of an infinite horizon of possibilities in an endless Babelian search for common ground. Regional proximity and the institutional supports of area studies might tempt us with an easy shore, but fall short of that aspirational spirit of Afro-Asian transregionalism embodied by Bandung, to say nothing of the Americentric concerns that underwrite area studies institutional supports. If comparative literature offers some sanctuary, it leaves unaddressed the potential methodological and coherence of broad comparative work within the Global South, offering us no fixed canon, no clear constellation of texts through which are to mark our bearings. Polaris, to extend the earlier metaphor, is not seen in the southern hemisphere, and southern skies offer no exact equivalent. Overtaken by the double threat of disciplinary inertia and methodological incoherence, the effort of Bandung comparatism may seem stillborn. And yet in the partial sanctuary of comparative literature as a changing discipline that is still contending with its double inheritance of a, quote, European philology in exile and a post-colonial criticism in revolt, unquote, to borrow Simon Gikandi's terms, one might find, if not a guiding constellation of fixed textual and theoretical reference, at least a glimmer of hope in the enduring conceptual problems that the field leaves unresolved. In light of some of Amir Mufti's suggestions elsewhere in his writing on Orientalism and the institution of world literature, perhaps another way of framing or contemplating this double inheritance and irresolution might be to revisit the implications of what he terms radical or post-Orientalist philology amidst the, the demands of broader Afro-Asian comparisons. To my mind, what remains at the vortex of these lines of sight is not is the fate of the post-colonial vernacular in comparative work, if not in a common language leading us beyond this Babelian horizon, at least as a conceptual point of departure, perhaps to borrow a little light from Auerbach. Bearing in mind these general concerns, my own contribution to this today will be to offer one possible suggestion for what poetics in the spirit of Bandung might entail. Noting, as Antoinette Burton has suggested, that Bandung quote, embodied both revolutionary romanticism and realpolitik, unquote, I'd like to take as a point of departure the linguistic framing of a vernacular revolutionary poetics in the Indonesian case to suggest broader lines of connection across former imperial divisions and across a sequence of Afro-Asian contexts, moving from Indonesia to Egypt to the westernmost extremes of this continental space to Senegal. My ultimate objective across this comparative arc is to highlight the shared existential struggles of literary vernaculars within a common ecumenical context and within a common historically Arabophone literary space. By revisiting a comparative poetics of the vernacular across imperial lines, I also highlight the ways in which the fate of vernacular writing has been complicated by the interventions of Orientalist philologists and colonial officials through the politicization of Arabic as a fraught cultural symbol and boundary marker. Across the diversity of these three cases, my larger aim is also to emphasize that the process of vernacularization or the ascent of local vernaculars if it occurred as a potential mid midwife to national cultural forms, did not necessarily occur against the larger decline of a liturgical standard. The poetic figure, to begin with the Indonesian case, whose legacy has come to be synonymous with the Indonesian revolution, Khairul Anwar, may not seem an obvious choice for the honor. Though often characterized as politically noncommittal, profoundly irreverent, accused most notably by leftist critics for holding no firm convictions, Khairul Anwar had a brief poetic career that nonetheless historically coincided with the most turbulent years of the Indonesian revolutionary movement from 1945 to 1949. His reputation for irreverence in poetry is frequently read by later critics in the 1950s as a metonym for independence, conveyed in tones of insouciance and indifference, often understood as a kind of revolutionary stoicism. Contributed, contributing to Hyrule's association with the revolution is a short poem he had composed and addressed to Sukarno, the leader of the Indonesian nationalist movement, first president of independent Indonesia, and later host of the Bandung Conference. Entitled, A Pact with Brother Karno, or Pustujuan dengan Bung Karno, the poem begins with a characteristic irreverence that gives way to an oath as the poetic speaker merges with his addressee, and the poem assumes a devotional turn through the religiously inflected term zat, a Malay word taken from the Arabic that, meaning essence or profoundest self. The poem in full reads as follows in Indonesian first and then in English translation. Ayo, bungkarno, kasih tangan, 
mari kita bikin janji. Aku sudah cukup lama dengan bicaramu, dipanggang atas apimu, digarami oleh lautmu. Dari mula tanggal 17 Agustus 1945, aku melangkah ke depan berada rapat di sisimu. Aku sekarang api, aku sekarang laut, Bung Karno, kau dan aku satu zat, satu urat. Di zatmu, di zatku, kapal-kapal kita berlayar. Di uratmu, di uratku, kapal-kapal kita berlayar. Di uratmu, di uratku, kapal-kapal kita bertolak dan berlabuh. In English, based in part on Burton Raffles' translation with slight modifications, it reads, Hey, Brother Karno, give me your hand, let's make a deal. I've heard enough of your speeches, been roasted by your fire, been salted by the sea flood of you. From 17th of August, 1945, I've marched a long front right next to you. Now I'm fire, now I'm sea. Brother Carno, you and I are one zet, one flesh. In your essence, in my essence, dizetmu, dizetku, our ship sets sail. In your flesh, in my flesh, our ship sets sail. In your flesh and my flesh, our ships leave an anchor. Though the poem begins with an irreverent tone, with this image of the poetic speaker grilled and salted like a street side snack by a vendor's speech, it takes a devotional turn with the insertion of the monumental date that Sukarno declared Indonesian independence, August 17th, 1945. It is a devotional gesture that approaches the mystical through the transformative metaphor of the sea, describing the dissolution of the speaker into a greater imminence, a motif reminiscent of earlier traditions of Malay Sufi poetry that characterized the relationship between the self and the divine through comparable allegories of self-surrender. Giving rise to another motif reminiscent of Sufi poetry, the initial grilling of the speaker transforms into more, a more sacrificial conflagration, a motif that is all the more poignant as a vindication of Sukarno given the accusations leveled against him within the Indonesian Islamic press in the years preceding the revolution. In several of his public speeches leading up to the revolution, and in an attempt to curry favor with Islamic religious conservatives, Sukarno had vigorously characterized the relationship between Islam and the nationalist movement in terms of an api Islam, the fire of Islam, to suggest that Islam had imbued Indonesian nas nationalism with its spirit and zeal. Sukarno's use or misuse of fire as a metaphor for re religious passion raised a storm of controversy within the Indonesian Islamic press, with critics of Sukarno claiming that the phrase fire of Islam was incomprehensible in a scriptural Arabic context, given that the predominant Quranic term for fire is the Arabic term nar, generally a metonym for hell and eternal damnation. This, of course, render Sukarno's phrase api Islam less the passion of faith than the hellfire of religion. For Sukarno's religious critics, this rhetorical misstep was a symptom of Sukarno's Quranic illiteracy and secular orientation and grounds to condemn as ideologically suspect his claim to the symbiosis of Islam and Indonesian nationalism under his political leadership. In this light, Hairu's poem can be seen all the more to play with the threshold between devotion and irreverence in an apparent reclamation of Sukarno's own figurative language and through the subtle rallying of Islamic mystical reference for the nationalist cause, where the poet dramatizes the consequences of being moved by Sukarno's speech. The poem also serves as the reclamation of a historic choice at the threshold of independence, to burn with Brother Karno in the revolutionary claim to national unity, whether that be in glory or in hellfire. If this seems reason enough to uphold Hyrule, the poet of the Indonesian revolution, there may be an additional, perhaps more mercenary factors uh, beyond his own poetic merits that contributed to his elevation to canonical status, a reason most legible when framed within the longer prehistory of the Indonesian language or Bahasa Indonesia. As rightly noted by Benedict Anderson in Imagined Communities, who, it should be remembered, cut his teeth as an Indonesianist before gaining a reputation as a comparative theorist of nationalism, quote, almost no Indonesian at the time of Indonesian independence 
spoke Bahasa Indonesia as his or her mother tongue. Virtually everyone had their own ethnic language, and some, especially people in the nationalist movement, Bahasa Indonesia or Dienst Malaysia as well. Today, there are perhaps millions of young Indonesians from dozens of ethno-linguistic backgrounds who speak Indonesian as their mother tongue, unquote. As Anderson also writes in support of his general thesis that, quote, print language is what invents nationalism, certain dialects inevitably were closer to each print language and dominated their final forms, unquote. This partially explains Hyrule's relative appeal within the post-revolutionary formation of an Indonesian national canon. As Hyrule's North Sumatranese Medanese mother tongue, by convergence of historical accidents, was relatively close to the linguistic print standard that came to be nationalized in post-independence Indonesia, relative, that is, to the majority of Indonesians whose mother tongue at the time was Javanese. What has been frequently overlooked in most conventional accounts of this process, and by scholars no less formidable than Anderson himself, is that the print standardization of proto-national Indonesian Malay involved the late colonial politicization of Ajami vernaculars in the Dutch East Indies, that is, the politicization of dialects that had, been, that had been historically transcribed in the Arabic script and sustained by Arabophone and the Arabophone religious elite. Notable among the Dutch colonial officials involved in this process was Christian Snukhorgronje, whose name appears in Said's work in Orientalism, a figure who, after completing his doctoral studies in Leiden, was stationed by the Dutch government to spy on Sumatranese clerics in Mecca before defining Islamic colonial policy in the Dutch East Indies in the wake of the jihadist Aceh wars in northern Sumatra. Snook's impact on the Arabic and Ajami language sphere within the Indonesian archipelago was to promote the Romanization of Malay within the North Sumatranese pedagogical realm an initiative in part based on the notion that the relative distance of a rising literate class of Indonesians from their devotional script would partially serve to depoliticize Islam in the region and allow for the more peaceable accommodation of Dutch interests. It was this Romanized standard that later became a dominant print vernacular for literary forms in the Indonesian archipelago, in part through the later ambitions of colonial officials and enterprising young Sumatranese editors in the Dutch-supported literary publishing house Balai Pustaka, an institution that was later transformed into independent Indonesia's main state-sponsored and educational publisher. When seen in this light, through the historical politicization of the Ajami vernacular, at the symbolic front lines of Arabic scriptural and colonial influences, it is in a way no coincidence that North Sumatra had been both the site of virulent anti-colonial uprisings with jihadist inflections and the birthplace of Khairul Anwar. Even the aforementioned controversies within the Indonesian Islamic press, challenging the Quranic and Arabic literacy of a figure like Sukarno, can be seen within this broader historical arc that marks Arabic as a symbolic boundary marker within a late colonial and changing national context. Also factoring into this wider frame was the call, again published in the pages of the Indonesian Islamic press, for the re-Arabization of nationalized Indonesian Malay after independence as a sign of true cultural autonomy from colonial rule. Underscoring the status of sacralized Arabic as a symbol and boundary marker within colonial, ecumenical, and proto-national contexts, these controversies that arc from the late 19th century through the period of independence and arguably to the present day collectively beg the question of whether, as Dutch Orientalists like Snukogronia had hoped and Sukarno's later religious critics had feared, the Romanized Ajami vernacular, orthographically and lexically removed from Arabic scripture, offered a relative gateway to secular tendencies within Indonesian politics and cultural forms. Put otherwise, to what extent does the fate of the Ajami vernacular against the scriptural offer an alternative genealogy of secularism variously understood within an Islamic ecumen. If this question remains an open-ended provocation, given its historical informants, or based on its historical informants, we can at least conclude that the ascent of a nationalized literary vernacular in Indonesia did not necessarily coincide with the decline of Quranic Arabic, a language which continued to be symbolically upheld and sustained within a post-independent national context. And the fact that vernacularization vernacularization did not necessarily occur against the decline of a sacralized liturgical standard is all the more salient in Egypt as a comparative case. If we shift in focus across former imperial lines 
from the former Dutch East Indies to Egypt, a former Ottoman British territory, and the host of the second Afro-Asian conference in Bandung's wake in 1957. The question of a national or revolutionary canon of poetry is in many ways not as straightforward as the Indonesian case, given the shifting orientations of Egyptian nationalism, historically fluctuating between relatively narrow territorial confines and Nasser's broader, Nasser's broader pan-Arab ambitions. What further complicates the issue, however, are the enduring controversies that attend vernacular writing in colloquial Egyptian Amiya against print standards that more closely follow Quranic and classical linguistic standards, or Fusha. This is particularly evident through the controversies that have plagued <coughs> Egyptian vernacular poetry through post-independence Egypt, leading to its peculiar status as an art form in many ways central to Egyptian national culture, but institutionally <coughs> marginalized at the expense of poets writing in a higher standard Fusha. Figures such as Fuad Haddad, who lauded the Bandung Conference in a 1956 poem entitled Farha, or Joy, or like Salah Jahin, who enshrined in poetic form monumental episodes of Egyptian nationalism, including the nationalization of the Suez, are popularly considered central to the cause of Egyptian national pride and collective memory, but they remain at the margins of institutional recognition, untaught in Egyptian schools, largely untaught in Egyptian schools, critically under-examined, and even censured for their audacity in coining the neologistic phrase Sha'ar al vernacular poetry, initially deemed a contradiction in terms given the long-standing association of Sha'ar, or poetry, with a higher classical register. Part of what informs this institutional resistance to canonizing vernacular poetry is the prevailing anxiety, again led by influential religious institutions and their proponents, that vernacular writing, if elevated to a broader print standard, would be a direct threat to Quranic literacy in Egypt. The association of vernacular poetry with leftist ideological sympathies has lent, lent additional fuel to the contra controversy, despite the fact that several prominent poets some avowedly Marxist, have protested against this unilateral interpretation of the vernacular and have themselves written poems within a devotional register, including praise poems of the Prophet, poems for Ramadan, and rewritings of the Rubaiyat form traditionally associated with Sufi poetry. Within a wider historical frame, further hindering the cause of vernacular print standards in Egypt was the tentative promotion of the Egyptian vernacular by some colonial officials during the British occupation of Egypt in the late 19th century, when Britain's chief engineer of the Aswan Dam, William Wilcox, for example, argued publicly that Egypt's widespread commitment to literacy in classical or Quranic Arabic was the principal cause behind its scientific regression. In support of Egyptian modernization and progress, Egypt, he argued, should follow a European example and abandon its allegedly archa archaic scriptural standards in favor of its spoken language forms. The backlash against this and other tentatives by British officials to promote mass ed education in the vernacular contributed, along with Turkey's divestment from Arabic, to the ultimate privileging of classical Arabic over the Egyptian vernacular in the proto-national and post-independence literary realm, with classical or Quranic Arabic functioning as a counter-imperial symbol and boundary marker to the detriment of institutional supports for vernacular Egyptian literature. To restate the larger point with a retrospective glance at the Indonesian case, vernacularization did not occur against the decline of a sacralized liturgical standard, and in another peculiar, peculiar similarity, the linguistic standard ultimately upheld as an official language for independent Egypt was like in Indonesia, no one's mother tongue. The same, of course, can be said of independent Senegal, where French remains the nation's official language. If we shift again our gaze westward across lines of imperial difference to Africa's westernmost continental extreme to Senegal and former French West Africa, we also find a vernacular print culture at the controversial front lines between Arabic scriptural and colonial inheritances. Although delegates from French West Africa were not present at the Bandung Conference, it is clear that French West African subjects have been inspired by its agenda. FEONF, the Federation of Black, Af West Af Black African Students in France, for example, in 1958, published a pamphlet entitled Le Sang de Bandung, The Blood of Bandung, in support of the struggle for Algerian independence, a pamphlet also inspired by the intensifying plot of the FLN. In keeping with the spirit of the times and the call for the ele elevation of indigenous cultural forms, Senegalese members of FEONF in the same year, 
published the first vernacular language syllabary for Wolof in romanized form, an initiative that prefigured the foundation of the first vernacular language journal in Senegal by many former associates of Feanf a little more than a decade later in 1971, a publication entitled Kaddu. Scholars frequently gloss over this publication, assuming that it was a humble literacy initiative. But this foundational journal significantly illustrates the existential struggle of Senegalese vernaculars against the dominance of both Quranic and colonial acrolects and scripts in the projection of Senegalese national consciousness. If the pages of Kadu highlight the existential struggles of these literary vernaculars within a Quranic inheritance and with a within a historically Arabophone literary space, in other ways, the publication suggests that this initiative to elevate the vernacular on a national platform did not necessarily occur against the decline of religious solidarities, solidarities, at least of a certain orientation. Despite Kadu's editorial calls for the distinction between Islam as a matter of faith and Arabism as a question of cultural affiliation, the pages of Kadu also exemplify a kind of exploratory reorientation of Senegalese national culture with the reaccommodation of scriptural influences, seeking to shed in its edit editorials on Senegalese history the notion that West African cultural memory began with the advent of Islam, the publication nonetheless commemorates historical figures of anti-colonial re religious resistance to French rule and highlights transatlantic Islamic solidarities in the cause of anti-colonialism and racial pride. It is in this light, for example, that the pages of Kadu not only revisit the histories of anti-colonial jihadists like Samori and Alaj Omar Tal, but also rebuke in veiled terms the relative political apathy of contemporary religious clerics and include praise poems and Wolof to figures like Malcolm X. In further evidence of this vernacular accommodation of the scriptural is the journal's quotation in its inaugural front piece of the Wolof Sufi poet, Serin Moussaka, defending the cultural parody of all languages. Any language is beautiful that raises the awareness of people that recognizes humanity and slaves. If the original verse might have been a Wolof poet's defense of vernacular writing in a devotional context, its use in the journal's front piece was clearly directed against the two inst institutional acrolects in Senegal, um, both colonial and scriptural. To read through the pages of Kadu, the ed editorial board appears to have struggled also with the problem of literary digraphia, evincing a sense of the textually orphaned vernacular historically, historically caught between two foreign scripts. Attuned to this issue of script as symbol, the journal's editorial board not only experimented with publishing poetry in both Latin and Arabic script, they included a syllabary for a third possibly invented script in its final issues, a symbolic rejection of foreign spheres of literary influence. I'm still looking into the provenance of this, by the way. A final note to suggest within a broader historical frame how the fate of writing in Senegalese vernaculars may have been complicated by the interventions of Orientalist philologists and colonial officials through the politicization of Arabic as a fraught cultural symbol. Here I point beyond the more conventional accounts of the unilateral expansion of French through a colonial politics of assimilation and association. If colonial French West Africa seems geographically remote from the former Dutch East Indies, there's nonetheless a partial commonality, given that the aforementioned Dutch Orientalist Snukor Gronje's policy recommendations migrated to French West Africa. Several months following a publication of his recommendations into French colonial policy journals in 1911, a memo banning the use of Arabic for administrative and judicial purposes in French West Africa was circulated, despite the fact that both French and Arabic had been until that point employed for administrative purposes. This convergence of policies may in fact have contributed to the situation later inherited by mid 20th century Senegalese writers, advocating for a vernacular print form and yet caught between the influence of Ar influences of, of Arabic as a predominantly private acrolect and French as a publicly sanctioned one. Again, looking back on all three cases, in none was the official language of the post-colonial state anyone's mother tongue at the moment of in independence, suggesting perhaps that a comparative poetics in the spirit of Bandung arrested at this historic moment might by necessity be also a poetics of estrangement and inter internal exile. I'd like to conclude by returning our attention back to where we began with a final note on what historically conjoins Senegal to an Indonesian sphere of influence, perhaps in the spirit of Bandung humanism 
at its best. Although Leopold Sedar Senghor, the negritude, negritude poet and first president of independent Senegal, never attended the Bandung Conference, he is alleged to have considered it from afar the most significant historical event since the Renaissance. But while praising it as a collective condemnation of colonialism, Senghor expressed certain anxieties about the potential dangers of emerging nationalisms narrowly defined. And he frequently characterized nationalism as a myth and a malady inherited from colonial Europe. Senghor's intuition was nowhere more poignantly engaged than in his responses to Indonesian territorial ambitions in the wake of the Bandung Conference. For Senghor was one of the few in the UN Gener General Assembly casting a vote in protest against Indonesia's annexation of East Timor. He had also opposed Indonesia's national annexation of West Papua and financially supported Papua New Guinea's first literary journal, in part reading in the plight of Polynesian culture against hegemonic Malay dominance and affiliation with the negritude movement. If Senghor's example, then, also deserves commemoration as an affiliative gesture of solidarity across national divisions, one might conclude that the spirit of Bandung is also a practice of vigilance, especially at the thresholds of its own betrayal. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and that, um, thank you. I really like that, uh, that paper. Did you know that uh, less than a year later, the first black congress of black artists and intellectuals met in Paris, and Senghor and Césaire were among them. And I've often wondered of what Bandung had to do with that, because I think it was something of an inspiration to that particular, that particular conference. Yeah, I, I really, I need to follow that further. Um, mm -hmm. I, say, I, I need to follow that further, uh, that lead further. Um, the, um, definitely, I'm, I'm sorry I don't know more about it, but. Yeah. Um, it's a 1956, yeah. Of presence African. Yeah, right, okay. And it was, I believe it was September of 1956. <laughs> and Fanon was there, Richard Wright, George James Lamb Baldwin. Lamb 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 was there. Hmm? Lamb Lamming was there. was there. It was a very important transatlantic meeting mm -hmm. of black artists, uh, intellectuals. Horace Mann Bond was in the American delegation and, and Senghor gave one of the uh, one of the main talks okay. for that conference and I've always thought of them in the same in the same breath historically yeah. taking place at, at, at roughly the same time that yeah. they were both post-colonial and also having a reference to uh, civil rights in the United States absolutely yeah. yeah thank you for that suggestion yeah Right. 
it's one of the things that makes Bandung un unusual if you're trying to figure out where to plant your periodizing flag are precisely these efforts that you're describing. Right, that, that is, the, the common term doesn't seem to, 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 to generate in, in, in the, the 20th century doesn't seem to generate um, these uh, linguistic and, and literary efforts. Uh, the abolitionists in 1790 or, or, or 1830s still don't generate those kinds of, kinds of efforts. Um, so so why, 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 why was Bandung successful on that front when the earlier version was you know, I, I take Bandung and as, as an, a historical event of symbolic importance, but, you know, in a way, the fact that it has been eclipsed for so long um, in historical memory and in post-colonial studies, it's sort of fallen out of um, most, you know, the purview of most scholarly circles until very recently, actually s suggests that it wasn't as successful as um, initially intended. And I think that maybe in following you know, Amir Mufti's suggestion, it, it may be up to us to understand why and, and pursue correctives. Again, in the spirit of Bandung, maybe in the wake of its actual failures, you know, um, in pursuit of that project. Um, in terms of comparisons to earlier moments, claiming to these broader horizontal comparisons, I don't, I don't know enough about those comparative histories. I mean, it's, it's a really, I mean, one could look capaciously, right? Um, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting point that you raise about, you know, a very problematic, I mean, about the problem of upholding Bandung as a unique moment. I mean, that's really more, I guess, a question still for me also, uh, perhaps, rather, even though I, um, even though I uphold it also as a symbolic moment. Um, despite its effectiveness or lack thereof. No. But don't you think it has something to do with the fact that uh, Bandung is the non-aligned colored nations of the world and that that's really in contrast to something like uh, that the radical history, European radical history that you say? Mm -hmm. I think somebody like um, uh, Cedric Robinson would probably read it that way in his history of, or his reading of black radicalism. I think he would probably say that, that, that the racial angle there is, is, is significant for mm -hmm. the participants. So one of the, the really dumb idea that I've been carrying around in complete ignorance is just that in general, the language of Bandung was kind of universalist. Mm -hmm. uh, and when post-colonial studies comes in, it's partly kind of anti-enlightenment, anti-Western in the way that Bandung wasn't. Hence the term in the Bandung community. Mm -hmm. But is that wrong? I mean, that, could I carry it around in utter ignorance? But that would certainly say something about the reason for the eclipse. Mm -hmm. I mean, the eclipse to the extent that people you know, are kind of anti-universalist. Now, maybe we're not anymore. Yeah, that's a, so. thank you. That's a great, great, incisive point. Thank you. Um. Yeah, could I push back a bit on this thing on Bangdong humanism um, and also push back a bit on this thing of Bangdong internationalism and to suggest that we might want to see Bangdong as a specific symbolic moment. 1955, when decolonization is already taking shape in the form of independent nation states. And that prior to that, what is fascinating is to actually look at both the political and literary forms that are beginning to emerge in the 30s and in the 40s in various metropolitan countries where both African and African diaspora, a lot of it, uh, uh, people from Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on, are meeting and thinking through a certain kind of internationalism. An internationalism that is different from the common terms, mm 
but also an internationalism that is explicitly against an independent nation state. In other words, there is a conception of independence, but independence within forms of federation. Mm -hmm. So that you, because you don't want to get caught up into nationalisms. Right? Yeah. And so that if you compare a set of newspapers that are published in Paris, a set of newspapers that are published in English in the 1930s and 40s, led by people who have left the common term and some who are kind of still circling around and so on, you will see that they, they argue for a certain kind of internationalism mm -hmm. and a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of what I like to call human solidarities mm -hmm. um, for all sorts of peoples, right? While talking about the anti-colonial uh, anti movement. So by the time you get to 55 in Bangdong, what you are seeing is actually the implosion of that and the, cons and the beginning of, and the, the emergence, in my view, of a certain kind of nationalism. And that that nationalism is tethered to the actual nation state. Mm. It is interesting, I think, Hortense, because by the time you then, if you look at the proceedings of the 56 conference mm -hmm. uh, and look at the debate between Richard Wright and Amy Césaire mm -hmm. right, and Fanon, mm -hmm. and Fanon walking out of the conference, and Lamin's thing about Lamin's contribution. What you will begin to see is after that split between people, Senghor has a particular position that is actually defending a certain kind of nation state. I mean, Senegal is clearly going to be independent fairly soon. Um, Ghana is about to be independent the following year. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. Césaire is trying to think through questions of departmentalization and what I would call kind of non-sovereign citizenship mm -hmm. in relationship to Martinique and Guadeloupe. And Fanon is saying, I mean, all of all of your houses are nonsense, right? And and, and you know you know and the Algerian thing is showing us something different. And we need to we need to, we need to, we need to think about it differently. And what then I think becomes really interesting is that Bangdong is then transformed into another line movement, right? Very quickly, in three four years, it becomes another line movement, and another line movement becomes an operation, the decolonialized oper operationalization of independent states that attempt to mark a position in the world by working particularly through the United Nations. I mean, you know, you just, if you look at the transition and you look at the documents and you, you know, you begin, you, you, you see, I think, the way the thing, the way the thing works. And at that moment, I would ask, the questions of a certain kind of vernacularism, military vernacularism, becomes really, perhaps, even more important, mm -hmm. right? Because of one way to contest the kind of, if you want, you want to put it the bourgeois nationalism to use that language that emerges uh, in the nation state is actually a turn towards the vernacular mm -hmm. as one way to begin to think of okay how can we begin to think through different forms of subjectivities in this at this specific moment when you have when you when you have a nation state that has already been constructed quite frankly within the pale, pale limitation of, of Europe right? and so that it is it is I mean, do, I mean, to me, those are, that, that's, that's the kind of, that, that's what one is looking at. So I want to push back against Bangdong humanism mm -hmm. because I want to, want to suggest that it's a, it's a rubric that may not actually capture a set of complexities at a specific historic mm -hmm. moment. Um, I understand why it is there, but that there is perhaps another form and other elements of humanism that were, um, you know, what some people call radical humanism, that were there before, that actually got lost in the bang bang mm. I think that's a, just a really quick response. I think that's a great point. And um, I think that if you were ex to extend, you know, our, the purview of what I would have brought up today to uh, more um, closely focus on Senghor, who was involved in, you know, in these movements in the 1930s and, and 40s, um, I think you'd see the sort of tensions between the sort of federalist and nationalist aspirations and, the, and their changing form um, across those, you know, surrounding and preceding the Bandu Conference. Um, another way to look at this might be to 
to recall that Senghor was himself also a defender of vernacular poetic forms in the 20s and the 30s, and a con contrast that in a proto-nationalist, in the proto-nationalist context of, uh, or, or late colonial French West Africa with Semben's calculations as a print, vernacular print activist in the 1960s, you can sort of see some of those tensions fall into place along with um, you know, what I mentioned of Senghor's own anxieties about, about uh, Bandung um, and, its, and its potential contradictions. Um, I mean, I'll just also mention that he had considered um, or mentioned and proclaimed in some of his speeches that Senegalite when understood in the very narrow terms as a kind of national superiority complex was a malady as well. Um, so thank you. That's a very uh, helpful comment and gives me much to think about. Well, I first of all want to thank you so very much for sharing with us work that you feel to be still on its thin ice of, of, of formation, but that is so bold and ambitious and interesting. Uh, I, I mean, would, you, would you say that you have an idea of what the book project is and you're filling in pieces to make sure that we're, or are you still actually exploring the pieces to figure out what the book would be? Um. I think both, really. I mean, really both. Um, there's there's still a lot of, you know, primary work that I need to do in, in order to uh, fill things out. I mean, I started as a francophonist actually, wow. and and um, and it was in the course of studying Sam Ben that I felt I I can't just be a francophonist. Um, you know, and I was raised in Indonesia, so this is part of what informs the larger mm -hmm. larger project as well. So, um, really, the the additions. In, in broadening the work um, at this point are uh, a more extensive exploration of the Egyptian national context. Um, but, you know, with every addition, it's meant a complete transformation of the broader arc of ideas um, that are, you know, um, shaping uh, my reading of the text as well, so. Can, can you say anything more about your use of the term vernacularization? That is, yeah. I don't know the, the whole you know, set of usages of, of that term. It's my, and I only bring this up particularly because you've made reference to Amir Rufi's work. My sense is that in his work on, uh, on India, uh, the term has a, a rather particular and somewhat sinister uh, significance. That is to say, vernacularization is, is part of trying to root in the soil for broadly uh, nationalist purposes, what, at least as, as he understands it, I think, uh, had, had quite a different uh, character before it began to be transformed by the process of vernacularization. Mm -hmm. So the turning of, you know, in his account, the, the, the metamorphosis of Hindustani into Hindi and Urdu uh, comes about through the sinister process of vernacularization. I'm not oversimplifying, but, but I, that's how I read his account. And I, I, mean, I, I wonder if, you're, if there is, in, for, for you, a distinctly more neutral usage, I think so, uh, mm -hmm. and more broadly, what the what the use of the term is in you know in the in the various scholars you will have been using and, and interacting with by reading and by uh, exchange concerned with similar issues. Yeah. Well, I think yes. In, in short answer to your question about whether or not I'm using it in more neutral terms, yes. Um, and um, in terms of the a sort of scholarly constellation or uh, of or. Uh, my interlocutors or my early interlocutors in this, in this sense. I mean, I'm definitely um, thinking about how some of the research that I'm doing and the texts that I'm looking at um, qualify some of Anderson's chronologies on vernacularization and looking to European history in paradigmatic ways, um, which of course is taken up by Pascal Casanova and which Amir Mufti has, has uh, objected to. Um, so in a way, this is a supplementation of that that those objections, which uh, others like 
other historians like Michael Laffin and Ziad Fahmi in, in Egypt have, have also raised. Um, you know, I'm also, and this is, I think, really not being done thus far, uh, is exploring what you might call a Quranic approximation of the vernacular, um, a term, um, ajami, a relative to the Arabic of, of uh, Quranic revelation, and um, as sort of a conceptual term through which to frame the, 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 uh, an understanding of the vernacular across these different local contexts. Um, I mean, it's also been used as a term for uh, vernaculars written in, in Arabic script in uh, the African continental case, um, but I'm wondering to what extent that term can be broadened um, or extended, um, you know, beyond beyond uh, beyond those that context and um, its associations with Persian as well to include include nominally Arab vernaculars as well, um, So um, that's. Another exploration that I'm pursuing at this point, uh, but you know, even in sociolinguistic circles, I've only seen one scholar suggest that, um, or um, also suggest that that might be a possible lead for reframing the vernacular in a scriptural Arabic context. You just again to speak of matters of high interest, but also on my side, high ignorance. Uh, in uh, particularly Western European contexts, uh, vernacular is, has so much to do with the idea, the historical idea of Latin into all the various romance languages. And of course, by, by contrast with regard to Arabic, uh, it has happened and not happened. And it's the happening, not happening that, that, I'm, that I'm asking blankly about. That is, are there claims by either uh, cultural ideologues or a certain kind of scholar that, in fact, the, the various uh, non Quranic Arabics are indeed fully and precisely French and Italian and Spanish? Hmm. I like the equivalence. Um, I found that um, yeah, that's a that's a big question. Yeah, um, yeah. You yeah, could a, say that that the that the, that the Latin to Romance model is just uh, a an accidental delusion of a mm -hmm. certain small corner of history. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, a lot of people within the Anglophone. Uh, and Western European world will have that as their model for right. thinking about these matters, which isn't to say that what you're showing and doing <laughs> isn't illuminating and, and important, but it's just to say, is, is, there, anything, is there anything we can do to, to get the term somewhat under better control? Mm -hmm. Again, within, within US contexts, uh, vernacular has you know, yet a different set of precedents. Yeah. Uh, since, uh, you know, and, and that's a whole other story. Yeah. You, you laugh at control because- No, no, I agree with you. I did just, <laughs> because in the US context, yeah. thinking of Williams, who yes. was in the American writer, right. and in, in especially in terms of the issue of African American writing, it, it's, it's a completely different dynamic. Yeah. And the resistance to both <laughs> the British, but also to kind of standardized American versions of other kinds of uh, communities of language in the U.S. At one point in my own writing, I tried to argue against people making certain kind of uh, claims for American vernacular by saying, no, historically, linguistically, pre-old more than vernacular would be the best term. Yeah, right. Anyway, this yes. just to say how, how interesting, and I look forward to more. Thank you. There, there's a lot of work to be done. If I Thank you. for just one second. I apologize profoundly for having had to leave the room, but I am sure you've had a lot of really good discussion while on the way. But we've been really pushing in that past the time that she's promised to be here. So why don't we allow David and then we'll end with that? Okay. Well, you get more. I'm sorry. Will you, you take both? I'll take both. Yeah. Okay, fine. Great. Just let me follow up on Jonathan's point. Um, uh, as my we're talking about a lot of things that are really interesting, and that was uh, 
part of where I was thinking was what I think Jonathan is thinking about as well, and I wonder if you have thoughts about this. You talked about um, a phrase I hadn't heard before, which was liturgical standard, right? Yeah. And um, I think that's exactly right. Like Latin was a liturgical standard, right? right. But it was not a spoken language in the, in the sense that we use that. And vernacular at that moment meant spoken language, right? It didn't mean necessarily informal or, right? It meant the thing that people were speaking. And it also meant the thing that was being spoken in a very specific geographical location, right? It was not the mother tongue of most people, right? So when you look at like, um, you know, in 1492 when Sp Spanish gets standardized, right? It's a language of, a, the spoken language of a small group of people that is then put into print in order to build a nation, right? And part of the point is you put it into print what a small group of people speak who are the high people, and then you tell everybody else these are the high people. Right? And it seemed like you're, to some extent, I was looking at the history of Bahasa in Indonesia, right? It seems like mm -hmm. that is kind of that history, too, where you kind of take the way the ruling people speak and you sort of encode that into print and then you shoot it out everywhere. And it seems like, and it seems like you could get some of the same, and my understanding about Arabic is that that's sort of true in Arabic also, that it is a, the written Arabic as it's like used in religious services is not, you know, you can translate it into the way people speak to some extent. It's a gap, right? There's a, and that's true in India also, right? I don't know if, and so I guess what I'm wondering is, are we, is there some kind of general pattern that you see sort of being, I mean, that you might go back to the early modern period as well as the, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's a lot to respond to there. Thank you for the the comment. Um, you know, first, I in my use of liturgical, I also still have questions about its um, appropriateness. I've actually had medieval medieval uh, Europeanists who have said that it's actually very the term liturgical really should be, you know, limited to historical context of Latin Christendom, and it, it really isn't applicable uh, to the Arabic case. I mean, another another reason uh, might be also. I mean, Arabic is. Quranic Arabic, what we understand is Quranic Arabic was a revelational language, not just a liturgical language, and so there's entire, an entire politics of translatability and untranslatability surrounding that as well. Um, you know, um, in the Indonesian case, you know, there's, what's, what's peculiar about it is about what came to be upheld as a, a nationalized print standard later is that, um, it's a very, a very complicated story, but um, it had also been an interinsular inter trade language, Malay, um, and also associated with, a, uh, with uh, dialects of certain, language, certain islands like Sumatra more closely than you know, the most populous island in Indonesia, Java. And so it wasn't actually necessarily the, um, a court standard. You know, it was this sort of uh, convergence of um, you know, colonial language policy and the treatment of, um, um, uh, in response to certain political uh, uprisings and, and, and unrest and crisis um, that, um, th that really factors into the story of what came to be Romanized and upheld as a, as a print standard later. So it's not exactly that um, this print standard was based on what was spoken by a ruling elite. Um, so um, I think that the this, this story might be a little bit more complicated than that, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a concise way of conveying that. And I mean, it's I'm sure many Indonesianist linguists would also take issue with the way I've characterized it. But um, I think that's 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 there is a distinction there also to be made. Um, and this is a real quick comment following up on Hortense's comment about the meetings in Paris. Uh, in September 1956, you might want to look at MSS. You might know MSS's letter to Maurice Torres. Um, no, I think this I This is the uh, general secretary of the French Communist Party. Mm -hmm. He leaves the Communist Party, and this is a long letter explaining why. And he takes up issues of language and universalism in that. And I think it would be very uh, interesting to know how much of a terrain was set for the second round of the conflict from all of these things happening in Paris the year before. Mm -hmm. But the letter to Maurice Torres is, is a very 
well-known document that many other Caribbean writers responded to, for example, René de Pestre, very negatively. But it lays out the problems in the term universal in ways that then Chinu and Chebe would <laughs> follow up much later. Yeah. But it's a great document. Yeah. Thank, so thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you.